morning, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. I think I have a lot of gratitude uh, today because I'm talking about something that I'm so passionate about. And I'm actually in my mother country talking about it after visiting and doing about 14 women's health conferences in other parts of the world. So I really, really have tremendous gratitude for women's health, um, the Global Women's Health Conference for, uh, for starting this in initiative. It's a pretty tough uh, decision to do, and I'm sure it will have a wonderful and fruitful future as we move ahead. So today what I'm going to talk about really is how we can start thinking about reimagining the space of women's health. Healthcare was, is an area that was created by men for men. It was never created for women. And I think today we have reached a point in our lives that we are beginning to question whether this system at all works for women uh, in any frame, frame uh, form. And for that, we are trying to assess what is the best care delivery method for it to work. And what I will present is really a State of the Union address looking at the global female technology market, what is happening, what are some of the big trends, and why this change is taking place. So I'll really focus on three big things. I'll talk about the she economy. I'll talk about whether female technology is really, really serving the needs of the healthcare industry of women. Are we focusing on the right solutions, on the right products? And eventually I'll talk about two areas that I do believe has tremendous potential and a growth opportunity for India itself, which is menopause and infertility. So where does the she economy come from? A lot of my work that I do at Frost & Sullivan is working as a futurist. And no, I don't uh, look at tea leaves, nor do I just look at the sky and make predictions. Uh, what I do is I have, we have a team of almost 1,200 analysts and consultants all over the world, one of them whom is sitting right here in front of me. Raise your hand, Suchi. She's a femtech um, analyst based out of Mumbai. And uh, we look at some of the future predictions that are going on in the world, looking at mega trends. So what are mega trends? Mega trends are disruptive, transformative forces that have tremendous impact on every aspect of our lives, from social, economic, political, uh, you know, personal, etc. So I've been studying mega trends for the last two decades. I started studying this in the late 1990s when I was an analyst and I was exposed to Bill Gates's work on innovating to zero. Does anyone know what innovating to zero is? So basically Bill Gates started this concept in the late 1990s looking at how we can have a zero vision world for energy and this was almost 22 years back. So I was part of the consulting team that looked at this whole concept of how we can build this world and built a 10-year strategy at that point. But what we did at Frost & Sullivan is we took this whole concept of innovating to zero and we started looking at applying it to different industries. And my work over the last 20 years has really been looking at how do we create innovating to zero in healthcare. Are we talking about innovating to zero by way of zero pandemics, zero COVID, zero infections, zero hospitalizations, zero HIV, zero poverty? You know, there's so many different areas. And one of the big missions that I have personally is when I advise with clients is the first question I ask, him, ask them is, what impact are you looking at in the world in terms of the area you're working in, in terms of innovating to zero? So while we worked on innovating to zero, the whole aspect of health equity and gender equity comes up because obviously there's, there's a huge um, discrimination, if I can use that harsh term, in terms of where we are with women. But today we see a large trend towards the she economy. And I believe that this trend, this global macro trend that we are seeing towards she economy is almost as large as the sustainable revolution that we are, we are experiencing. So what has brought this trend about? Today it is an undebatable fact that women have become a very large commercial viable entity. We are contributing to the GDP of the world more than the GDP of the two largest countries in the world, 
US and China. The GDP that women contribute to the world is higher than that. So women are the primary consumers in almost every industry, whether it's electronics, whether it's consumer products, healthcare, beauty, wellness, every space you look at, women globally over the world are contributing tremendously to that. And that has led to the emergence that women have a voice, women need a place, and women's health means gender equity as a primary factor. So one of the things I started looking at, which is leading to trends in the she economy, is the emergence of the new woman. And who is this new woman? And again, I'm talking globally. I'm not talking with relation to India, um, because it might obviously differ. But it would help us to understand a little bit about where these trends are going. So we're going to come to an age in the world where 45% of women between the age group of 25 to 44 will be single by 2030. Today, we are finding that people are delaying having children to much later in life. By 2030, we expect the average age that women will have children will be 35. 20 years ago, it was 20 years, so it is, it is being pushed back. And with that being pushed back, the needs of women are changing drastically because of the delay of pregnancy and delaying the natural cycles. And that has huge impact on every aspect of a woman's life, including being able to understand what are the needs of these women going to be in the future for us to build products and solutions and digital around that. The second big thing that I see that has happened in the world around us is the whole aspect of social media. Social media is in every shape and form defining who we are, what we look like, what we wear, what we eat. What is also interesting is that 86% of women are influencers compared to 16% of men. It doesn't matter, of course, that men get paid more as social influencers than women, but women are leading in terms of being social influencers. Also, what is very important and interesting to note is that women make 80% of their decisions for purchase, which includes healthcare, through their social influencers. So this has dramatically changed the, the control and demand system of how decisions are being made by all of us as individuals. We are looking to others who are guiding us and setting the standards. And if you are in the world of selling any products or solutions, you really need to think about who are your social influencers in the space and what are they talking about in the particular disease area that you're talking about. In my view, I see four big industries that are really going to change the world today. It's going to be the self-care, the wellness, the food, education, and healthcare industries. And I would put my money into all of these industries because these are recession-proof today, for sure. There's going to be a huge amount of money over the next 20 years that are going into these areas. Obviously, the backbone of all of this is going to be data and digital. And the last area that I see a lot of change is the whole egg freezing area. And although it has a very somber aspect to it because it gives hope to millions of women who are able to freeze the eggs before going in for chemotherapy, it has also taken a, a kind of a different slant in different parts of the world. And I want to share a personal story with you. Um, I have a daughter who is who was a few years ago, who was 18 years old, and she was in a, in a college in Massachusetts. She was in an all women's all girls college in Massachusetts. And being 18 years old, she thought she could control and run the world and rule rule um, in every way. If you if you know what I mean. Um, so she came home. Uh, from her, one of her breaks uh, from college and she informed me, she was 18 at that time, she informed me that she wanted to freeze her eggs and uh, I was horrified but I decided not to use the mother aspect to this conversation and use the more professional aspect to it. So I asked her why she had come to the decision of freezing her eggs when she was 18 and she informed me that there were companies that were coming into college campuses, all women's girls college campuses and selling egg freezing packages on a subscription basis, which included contraception, uh, birth control, uh, tampons, uh, all of the products associated and needs uh, in a package. 
And then she went on to explain to me in terms of a cost-benefit analysis that if she froze her eggs at this time and paid this much of money, by the, end, by the time she wanted to have her child at 32 years of age, she would save that much based on uh, infertility treatment. Um, and this is all being programmed into young girls at colleges. So th this is where are we spending our time and energy focusing on really where the need is. And that's why I bring up this story so that it will tell us what is happening in the world today. We talk about advancement and emancipation of women and women's health, but are we spending our dollars in the right way? Um, of course, she did not freeze her eggs, just so that you, that you, that you know the, story, the end of the story. So where are we, what are some of the wins that we have made as an industry so far globally? Uh, there haven't been many wins, obviously, but some of the big wins I think that are happening is that we see more and more women going into medical school and becoming clinicians and OBGYNs, and our predictions are these numbers are going to look at like 66% of all physicians are going to be women and 55% of all physicians are going to be specialists, are going to be women. But I do have to say that the two areas where women still are falling behind is cardiovascular and orthopedics, and the numbers still stand to less than 15%. So we have to get more women into these areas to be able to make uh, impact. Um, in terms of companies and corporations who are ru ruling uh, assets and commercial viabilities, we see 26% of all CEOs uh, globally across the world uh, uh, being women, and obviously there's a large percentage of them coming from Asian countries. So what are some of the losses? I think one of the biggest losses is R&D expenditure. We have about 4% of funding that is going into women's health. So we are one of the most underfunded, under-researched groups, and yet we are 4.3 billion women in this planet, which means that we really need to step up in terms of our funding and research, which will increase the product pipeline of solutions to cater to us. And where does the money sit? Ultimately, the money is still sitting with men. 15% of all partners at VC companies in 2021 were women. So they have very little voice still today in terms of uh, being able to put in money into startups. And this economy is largely a startup-driven economy. So if we don't increase the number of women at the VC level, which is where we need to increase it, the, the funding will, will continue to deteriorate. So the big question that I ask all of you today is to really think about whether we are really doing enough to address the new generation of women that we see and the pain that they are facing in the world today, and are we directing our resources and time and money at the right aspects. This year was a very tough year for the United States. Um, obviously, we, uh, we, you know, the, I, I do believe that Roe versus Wade, the overturn of Roe versus Wade early in the summer of this year, had a huge impact on the political and economic climate in the United States. But I do think, in my view, if I had to make a prediction, there's going to be much more investment into women's health over the next few years because of this particular mandate. So what does the female technology market look like today globally? Now, I want to be clear how I define female technology because there's so many definitions out there for femtech. I'm not very much an advocate for femtech. I prefer to use women's health and female technology, but whatever it may be, whatever word you use to use it, it def it's basically defines any kind of product, solution, hardware, software, app, digital component to, uh, to a product that is tracking, that is therapy, that is monitoring, uh, that is preventing any kind of health issue. Um, I don't include fem care products into it, products for menstruation and fertility, etc., unless it has a digital component to it. So I'm very clear in my definition of what is fem tech. And it's very important for us to be comparing apples to apples. So how big is this market and how, where is it going? So there's about 1,300 companies globally there as of earlier this year, about 1,290 1, investors, 24 community organizations, and 15 R&D centers. This is to cater to 4.3 billion women. 
Where is digital health funding? A large part of how femtech is going to grow is going to be based on how much money is going into the sector in terms of investments for startups. Now this, uh, this portion of the slide and the numbers are fresh off the press. It's as we speak, uh, we put it on. Um, I have estimated 2023 numbers. There was a massive dip in 2022 to digital health exp uh, funding. You can see it went down from $60 billion to $27 billion, and it's going to go down even more for 2023, in my view, to $20 billion. So it's going to cut in half. So this is all global digital health funding, the, the stuff in turquoise blue, the bars in turquoise blue. Now what that really means is that the, the world is going to go through a recession in healthcare as well and digital health funding is going to come down. So very few people are going to get money and it's going to change the business models of how you go and get money as well. But what does it mean for female technology? Female technology share will also decrease, but not as much in terms of growth compared to digital health. So it's not going to be that bad, but still the numbers are going to be less than a billion dollars. Our best year was in 21 when we got 2.5 billion. This year we're going to not even get to a billion dollars. So it's, it's going to be a tough year for investments in female technology, which means that money is going to be hard to come by which means that we really have to think about the product and solution we have and the, and the commercial opportunity for it. So what do we see in terms of uh, companies? What does our success rate mean in terms of female technology? We've had three unicorns so far, Mar uh, Marvin Clinic, Kind Body, and LV. Uh, they're all billion dollar companies. I do believe that if you're a startup today, uh, a unicorn status is not something that you should be looking after, especially in this current economic climate. So I would suggest become a workhorse. Try to really work uh, your product, your solution, your platform uh, to get as many users as you can, to create as much data as you can. Uh, becoming a, million dollar, a billion dollar company is going to be hard in this climate. And um, I think the best of companies today are redoing their forecasts of what the future looks like. So that's my advice for startups. The overall market size for female technology products globally is about 3.45 billion. A large part of that money is coming from infertility globally. So this is where the market currently stands. And this is the global market that I'm talking about that, uh, that encompasses about 45 countries of the world where there are products and solutions. But are we really getting 50% of the $33 trillion that is being spent on healthcare? Why are we still niche? Why are we not mainstream? It's very sad to say that you go to major conferences of the world and there is very little on women's health by mainstream healthcare companies, whether it's drug companies, device companies, digital health companies, irrespective. I put down here five companies that are doing some work in uh, women's health. Hologic, which has the breast continuum of care, Bayer, G Healthcare, Philips, and Organon that touts itself to be a women's health company. But really, what is the level of work are they, are they doing? Are they really looking at the entire ecosystem of women's health? The other aspect, obviously, is the R&D that I spoke at. Right now, it's about, in the 1990s, 1% 1 of money went into R&D. We're expecting by 2025, it'll be about 6%. So it's still very, very little amount of money that's going into women's health research. We have some governments that have made a lot of initiatives over the last few years. For example, in the UK, they abolished the tampon tax. In Scotland, they give free, uh, free period products to any, you know, any woman. Um, and there's a lot of IVF initiatives in Japan and India being investigated, but still, I would say we are lacking behind in really finding and addressing the needs. So one of the big areas of work that we do is really focus on what health equity means, and gender equity really starts with health equity. And if you look at the last 20 years, the last 20 years has been really an era where we've recognized that this is an important issue. The UN Security Council put it out, the Women's Health Equity Act put it out, the UN Women's Nation put it out. Every year there's been different statements and advocacy that has been formed around it. But where are we today? I do think that this is going to be the decade of action for us. And what does women's health equity mean? 
First of all, it means equal access to affordable quality care. You have to have the right to choose your option. We need to have more women-specific research and clinical trials to better diagnose and study and treat women's diseases. We also need to cater to the unaddressed needs of women in many, many developing markets, which right now there is a supply and demand gap that is taking place. So this is a framework that we're using a lot when we are assessing where we are in terms of our development of women's health. So there's a lot of buzzwords that are put around, as you've probably heard in the last few years. We talk about precision health, we talk about social determinants of health, but what do these buzzwords really mean? Actually, in a sense, it really doesn't mean much. What we have to think about is three pillars and bringing these three pillars together to create a roadmap for women's health. The first pillar needs to be focused on R&D. If we don't get up, up our game on R&D and start putting in more money investing in women's diseases, we're not going to have the outcomes we need. So we need to have a platform and a program around R&D. Clinical protocols is very, very important. And one of the big things I, I, I study is how many, how many doctors are there, how many clinicians are there who really understand women's health the way it is today? Where are we in terms of that? And in order to establish clinical protocols, we need to get the right people doing the right job. And if the people who are doing the job have spent only two weeks studying menopause in medical school, they're not going to be able to do that job, sorry to say. Um, so th that, that is the reality of it. So the clinical protocols that are put down to study various issues that women face are not right, and that's what needs to be fixed. And then obviously creating the policies and the regulations around that to make sure that we're enacting that. So our framework for transforming care delivery for women uh, involves three areas, and obviously this is a futuristic look at what care will look, at, look like. One is obviously sex-specific care, which is care related to the needs that are anatomy-specific. Uh, so for example, uh, building prosthetics that fit into the muscles and the curvature of a woman's body and not a man's body. Uh, it's a very simple um, uh, kind of an example, but so far uh, when we looked at uh, areas in orthopedics, a lot of the prosthetics were fitted to men and then uh, aligned to women and put in and didn't work. So those are simple things that we can start thinking about when we address uh, women's health and anatomy specific areas. The second area is obviously sex-aware care, where we diagnose and treat women and men differently. Heart disease is one of them, diabetes is one of them. The symptoms, the, the attack, how, what a heart attack manifests in a woman is very different to a man. And are we studying it from a woman's point of view? Are we giving drugs that were tested on men or to women and saying this works fine? And then, of course, the third aspect is gender-sensitive care. And this is, a, this is an area very, very new that we just started looking at in terms of the LGBTQ area and, you know, and, and the new areas of what sex and gender means today. And are we starting to do clinical work uh, on that? We have no studies. We have nothing to say regarding that and the impacts of that. So that's another very big area that we need to work on. So any, uh, any program or solution that we look at will have to fall into either all three of these categories or one of these categories in order to provide uh, a robust platform for transforming care delivery. So now that I've just given you a little bit of an overall view and a bird's eye view of the future of what Femtech looks like, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about menopause. Um, you know, how are we looking at menopause in the right way? Are we, you know, are we diagnosing it? Are we treating it? Are there people to actually do that? And the reason I bring this in is because we're going to have 1.4 billion women in the world who are going to reach this area and we will have to manage this in a very different way compared to the way it's been managed in the past. In my view, menopause as an area is something that really needs reclassification and redefinition. Uh, it is not a pause. It was developed by Greek philosophers as something called a pause in life. Today, with the stresses of modern day living, it is no longer a pause. It is something that happens almost two decades and there are 38 symptoms that we have no solutions for. 
So the cure for menopause today for women who are experiencing it is tough it out. Um, we did a study in the United States with 2,000 women uh, earlier this year. And what is very interesting is that 6% of these women of the 2,000 were only prepared for these symptoms. 94% of them had no idea that they would be having these symptoms. You can see some of the numbers. 43% had low libido, 47% had brain fog leading to anxiety and depression, 49% had night sweats, sleep disturbances. 52% of these 2,000 women had hot flashes. They were not prepared for it. And there was no uh, future in terms of how this is going to be solved. So tough it out today is the pill that you have when you have men menopause. So, the, so as I started studying this area, I started realizing that why, why aren't we looking at menopause as a, a, rather as a condition in a clinic, clinical practice? And it's a life debilitating condition. It lasts for two decades. Uh, we don't have specialists who are there to treat it. We don't know who to go to, whether it's a general practitioner, whether it's an OBGYN, who do we go to? There's very little clinical studies on how this affects us and the future of chronic disease management as a result of menopause. There is very little reimbursement. Who pays for all of this? There's nothing there. It's not part of the healthcare system. It's not part of the reimbursement. And there's very little technological and digital solutions today. So really, in my view, Menopause should be treated as a chronic condition. And so what we did in our teams within our work is we started comparing what menopause looks like compared to diabetes. And I know I don't want to underestimate the seriousness of diabetes in any way when I make this comparison. But the reason I made this comparison is to just show how ridiculous it is that an area that is affecting 1.2 billion women in the world has less than a billion dollars spent in terms of products and services around it. And if you look at the numbers, you'll be able to see there are 50 million women who are entering menopause, there are 4 million women who have diabetes, compared to you know, $80 billion that is spent on diabetes products and services compared to less than a billion that is being spent on menopause. So there's obviously some area where there are huge gaps and money is going in the wrong places, not to say that we should not spend more money on diabetes, but I do believe we need to spend much more money on menopause. So if anyone's having a startup idea, this is an area to go into for sure. So what does this market look like? It's very much a symptom-based market today. You have a hot flash, you take some product. You have a mood swing, you, you do a tracking exercise or some wellness meditation. You have uh, you know, vaginal dryness, you use the cream. So it's very, very symptom-based. There is nothing looking at it on a holistic level. Dry eyes. Recently, um, we talked about dry eyes and menopause. Um, doctors could not believe that this was a dry eyes caused by menopause. There are studies after studies today that we're uncovering that is showing that dry, dry menopause leads to dry eyes, and yet, the drugs that we're taking for dry eyes is not tested on menopausal women. It's just on regular dry eyes. So there's a lot of issues and a lot of areas that we need to start thinking about as we redesign this space. The other aspect is monitoring and care. Again, monitoring and care is very much symptom specific. There is mental health, there's ovarian health, there's skin texture, there's lifestyle. These are some examples of companies that are working in, on it. But what about the big aspects of monitoring in terms of cardiovascular? We know studies after studies that have shown that hormone changes lead to a lot of issues in terms of heart issues, fluctuations, palpitations, headache, diarrhea, weight gain, weight loss, a lot of that. No studies have been done so far, very little work in this area. So we really need to start thinking of a holistic approach to women's health on a total level from birth to death. And right now, there is none that is looking at it. The second big area that I think that I want to talk about today is infertility. And the reason why I want to bring this up is that we recently completed a very large study that was sponsored by the World Bank, looking at 194 emerging market countries and their needs for infertility. And some of the data that I'll present here comes from that study. So today, if you look at infertility, 15% of couples um, in the reproductive age are infertile. So that's 
million couples across the world. If you look at the types of infertility that women and men suffer, 50% of that infertility comes from some problems that a woman gets. 20 to 30% comes from a problem that a man has, and both men and women combined is another 20 to 30%. But what our study actually found from, from, uh, from doing this survey across 194 emerging market countries was that of the 50% of women who are infertile in that age group, 94% of these cases came from emerging markets. Pretty shocking, right? Because it has a huge impact on the health and future generations of the human population from these countries by 2050. So the five top emerging markets with the highest prevalence of infertility from our study was China, India, Thailand, Philippines, and Indonesia. So a, a very, very large portion. And the results are pretty grim because it's telling you that by 2050, if we don't do anything, there won't be enough people left in the world, primarily. So what we started doing is looking at the products and solutions around infertility in different parts of the world and comparing them. And obviously, we found a huge mismatch between global supply and demand. Um, the United States has the largest number of infertility solutions in terms of digital femtech solutions I'm talking about here, uh, whereas there are only 72 million women. And if you take a country like China, 333 million women, there are two or three solutions only. So it just shows that we need to start putting in resources and money into the emerging markets area where that is where the pain is the highest. And this is another huge growth opportunity for us to work on to help serve the needs of women and men. So one of the areas of work that I have been doing for the last five years is looking at what digital twins look like. And I just wanted to share this with you to leave you with some ideas and thoughts of what a woman-centered, women-focused, quantified woman would look like in the future. Obviously, the base of this understanding is data. You know, we're really looking at data as the baseline of providing a holistic, quantified woman. So what is this actually going to look like? So if you look at the left-hand side, you have data that's going to come from a variety of different sources. It's going to come from your blood tests, from your mental health records, from your wearable data if you have a smartwatch. If you do fitness tracking, it's going to come from that. Diet tracking, it could come from your social determinants of health, where you live, you know, what your education is, what, your, what is your level of access to healthcare, um, including genomics data. So all of this data is going to be put into one record. It's going to be uh, analyzed. There's going to be data that will come out of digital therapeutics. It'll come out of virtual care visits that we have with our doctors, as well as any remote patient monitoring that we're wearing. And all of this data is then going to be aggregated by key digital enablers. It's going to be uh, set in the cloud, obviously. Um, and then we're going to use different algorithms to do artificial intelligence on that data. But it's going to be per person, per record, personalized. It's not going to be on a, on a large scale basis. Using that data, we can then do, obviously, population analytics. We can look at sets of populations and how they've been treated by various uh, co-committed -co conditions, by age group, demographics, etc. But what is the value of a digital twin? The value is going to be huge. It's going to be able to do disease management, guidance, education. We're going to be able to do clinical data management and analytics. We're going to be able to do predictive impact, that if this happens to this, this is what we can expect to happen. We can also do automated query support. We can do financial planning in terms of the, the, the needs of people and their health in the future. We can do cost comparisons of products and solutions we're buying, and obviously wellness rec recommendations. So this is going to become the platform for by which care will be managed and delivered in the future. And we're talking about it being personalized to the individual level, and obviously it's for this, in this case, it's going to be a quantified woman that's going to lead this. And this is going to become the backbone infrastructure for doing this work. 
Now, I was just recently, two weeks ago in Chicago at the RSNA conference, the Radiology Society of North America conference, where we had the, the biggest and greatest companies showing all their billion dollar equipment. But every single company and every single session I went for really talked about these platforms, really talked about bringing data from the CD scans and the imaging, uh, putting it together with pathology and IVD, putting it together with genomics and creating, uh, creating actual algorithms the rhythms to study it. So I think the next five to ten years is really going to be based on building this, these ecosystems and we have the G's and the Microsoft's and the Amazon's and the Philips Healthcare, all of this, doing this work to put this together and they're constantly looking for startups and small companies that can come and play into their platform. So a lot of potential for smaller companies to look at this. So I just want to leave you with the last slide, which is a fun slide talking of where we see the top 10 growth opportunities by 2025. Obviously, we're looking at three different areas, reproductive, menopausal, and senior care. I've included senior care because this is another area of big work that I've just started working on, looking at dementia, looking at Alzheimer's. Um, there's so much of work that needs to be done in this aspect because women have much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's and dementia than men do, but all the research so far has been completely on men. So this size of the bubble tells you the size of the opportunity. It's based on impact of quality of life and then impact on cost of care. Um, and it can go through the entire lifespan for a woman's life or it can be in specific areas. Um, for this part of the world, obviously, some areas that are very pertinent would be menstrual care and pregnancy in low and middle income countries, uh, sleep, uh, mental health, fertility, um, and then the last area which I do believe has a huge potential is the one-stop virtual medical care center for women. And I think that has a huge potential, just having a holistic one-stop care center which makes deals with all aspects of a woman's life from birth to death and, and becomes the, the foundation where we take this forward. So some of the questions that I want you to think about, I've talked about a lot of different things, but what I really want, to think, want you to think about is that digital is meant to really um, talk to the masses. It's meant to give you access to the masses. But is femtech still in the shadows of being um, you know, a higher cost uh, industry only catering to a certain population of people. How do we get it to becoming technology for the masses? Because we're still in, in, in the fringes of really getting into really women, real women. And, and the second big question that we really need to be thinking about is that do we have a robust enough delivery framework? Because for me, Precision Health is all about getting the right product to the right person at the right time to the right channel. And if we don't have that, we're not doing any precision health. So in anything that we design, are we being able to deliver a framework that is being able to answer that question? The right woman, the right time, the right way through the right channel. Because eventually that should be the goal of any health system. Thank you very much. Really been a pleasure to be here. I want to give a shout out to all the men in the audience. Without their support, we're not going to make this work. So thank you so much.